I would like to introduce our, our speaker tonight. We're very, very privileged to have with us um, Anna Gingrich, who's going to be talking about Chachapoyas, obviously enough. And we have a great person to do that for us. Um, Anna's been working in Chachapoyas since 2010, developing a whole series of lines of research and helping pull this area into a slightly more orderly um, chronology, understanding uh, all the things that we expect to see within an Andean area. So Anna got her PhD at the University of Chicago in 2014. She's currently a lecturer at Vanderbilt. Um, and from the beginning, especially for her dissertation, worked on monumental uh, domestic architecture in Chachapoyas, has been dealing a lot with issues of spatial organization in the area, and is also developing chronology, um, which is quite important. As, as we all know from however many decades we've been coming to these meetings, and experiencing chronological papers, very important stuff. So, um, with that, I, love to welcome Anna to the podium here to give a long anticipated it's the dessert for the meal talk. Anna. Chachapoyas, um, seems like, um, from what I can tell, about every 20 years or so, the Eastern Andes pop up again as the keynote lecture. Um, so I'm excited to be here tonight representing Chachapoyas. Uh, I'm especially excited that there were not one but two Chachapoyas lectures um, talks, so I'm not really sure if that's ever happened at any meeting before, so um, I'm pleased to be excited. Uh, so for those who know me, uh, I'm kind of like a, a major cheerleader for this area. Um, I think it's one of the most spectacular regions in the Andes, uh, and as part of this uh, not so hidden agenda, uh, I like to showcase a lot of uh, really uh, just extravagantly beautiful pictures of this area, uh, which I find one of the most interesting of the Andes. Um, so you'll be seeing a lot of those tonight. Uh, I want to preface, so rainbows, beautiful flowers, towering walls, etc. what we can think of um, when we think of Chachapoyas. Uh, so before I get into that, I just want to point out that, that uh, not everything is the best and most beautiful, so we have a lot of really ugly ceramics. This is not the main, the main focus of people's attention in this area. Um, so thinking a little bit more seriously, I do have a rationale for focusing on uh, images of landscapes. So given the extraordinary qualities of Andean landscapes, uh, our perceptions, and equally important, our preconceptions of them, have played a major role in the history of archaeological interpretation. So tonight I want to focus on these preconceptions and how they've shaped our narratives of the Eastern Andes and really the, the history of study. Um, and I'll be focusing uh, on this from the perspective of my research in central Chachapoyas. So I want to look at how new research is destabilizing many of these traditionally held preconceptions. But I also want to look at um, how new insights that we're gaining um, help us understand better the relationship between people and landscapes in this area. So kind of looking back to the past and then also moving forward. <laughs> so the Eastern Andes uh, are probably best known for their large expanses of montane forest, um, but they're actually one of the most distinctive ecological zones on the planet. So the Eastern Andes stretch uh, from Colombia all the way to Argentina. And in, in addition to this uh, latitudinal variation, they also span a considerable uh, range of altitudes. So they span from more or less 1,500 meters to 4,000 meters uh, above sea level. Um, so even though we tend to, I think, think of them in general as a kind of um, lowland area or group them with Amazonia, many of these areas are quite uh, high uh, altitudinally. So the combination of this latitudinal and altitudinal variation, uh, along with very heavy year-round rainfall in many areas, result in an especially diverse array of microclimates that are packed into very close proximity. So in fact, the northern portion of the Eastern Andes 
uh, actually represent the single most uh, uh, diverse environment on the planet uh, as measured in terms of endemic species. Um, and to just kind of throw another statistical figure at you, uh, even though the Eastern and Andes only cover about 5% uh, of the land surface of the Amazon basin, they contain as many species as the rest of it combined. So this really is a, it might be only a truly exceptional area. Overall, uh, the Eastern Andes have been deeply understudied relative to other parts of the Andes. In part, of course, this is, uh, this is due to the difficulties of working in this environment, um, but I would argue that it's also due to the assumptions that the conditions that make it difficult for us to work here today also made it difficult for people to comfortably live here in the past. Um, so, one way uh, in which the, or one kind of trope that has dominated the study of the Eastern Andes has been the idea of a no man's land. Um, and I think some of the earlier work of um, our colleague Warren Church uh, has um, really gotten at this idea um, in a very productive way. Um, so first, this might be understood in a metaphorical sense as a kind of frontier region between two cultural macro regions. So um, kind of a boundary between the Andes and the Amazon. Um, but also we might understand it as a kind of, or, uh, also might, we might look at the history of representation uh, in a more literal sense. Um, so the Eastern Andes being uh, a no man's land in the sense that no people were thought to be present here, uh, or at least very few people, and people who didn't matter significantly uh, or make a major impact on the course of Andean prehistory. Um, so for example, we've known for quite some time uh, about a number of different monumental uh, monumental remains present here. So Quayalapa was found in the 19th century. Um, also Grand Pajatan might be another example here. Um, so we know that these are present, but for many years these were um, attributed to societies that came from elsewhere. Um, so Andes or Amazon. So people that developed forms of complexity that they then brought with them to the Eastern Andes. Uh, we also see some of these tropes in contemporary research in Chachapoyas in particular, uh, where migrationist theories that account for the evolution of complexity um, still remain, still remain uh, major theories in explaining the course of the Chachapoyan prehistory. So these would be theories that um, have become less significant in other parts of the Andes, but they're still quite influential. Now the environmental factors that researchers have perceived of as discouraging cultural development in this area uh, are numerous. Um, so among a, a number of different factors, these would include uh, soils that are uh, traditionally thought to have been nutritionally deficient, unstable, and prone to erosion. Um, terrain that is rocky, uh, steep, uh, and broken, uh, and dense vegetation as well. So you can kind of see all of these factors expressed in uh, daily life, traveling down roads, um, we get landslides, floods, uh, and steep, steep terrain. So in fact, we've actually described uh, several forms of environmental determinism that have been at work in shaping the history of the Eastern Andes. Um, so first we might mention a kind of ecological determinism that the Eastern Andes um, uh, have shared with the Amazon basin. Um, so this would be a kind of an attribution of deficiency to tropical forest areas. Um, this is largely changing in lowland South America at this point. And secondly, I also might mention a kind of topographical determinism, which would be more commonly shared with other areas of the LIP highlands. So this perspective sees mountains as places that are generally only settled as a matter of last resort, and places that uh, possess limited potential for cultural development. But at the same time, factors that might be understood as generally beneficial to the well-being of human societies have also been interpreted as limitations in the sense of thwarting the emergence of politically complex societies in the Andes. Um, so some of these might include uh, regular rainfall uh, that rendered irrigation systems largely unnecessary, uh, and also easy access to a diverse array of closely packed microclimates. Now in Chachapoyas, uh, in particular, uh, recent research has indeed upheld the conclusion uh, that state-level forms of organization did not develop here autochthonously. Um, but I want to think a little bit beyond this idea of the state tonight um, and think of more um, uh, diverse approaches to complexity. 
In particular, empirical and theoretical advances are both demonstrating uh, that nearly every other assumption about the history of human landscape relations uh, should be questioned. So we're in a moment of um, great change uh, in our interpretations area. Um, so for one thing, it's now clear uh, that not only were humans present uh, in this area from a very early period, um, so from at least the late Pleistocene, but they're also widely distributed across this area by as early as the uh, early intermediate period. Um, so these are some of my, uh, um, some of the early intermediate period contexts, the contexts that I found in my own research in central Chachapoyas, um, but in a, in a number of other areas too, we have very clear evidence that people were present although we still have very little sense of what actually was taking place at this time. In addition to this, it's also becoming increasingly clear that we can assume that the landscapes that we are familiar with uh, looked the same over the past several millennia. Um, so this also requires us to engage with the different history of people and landscape. Um, so we have the uh, good fortune of a number of recent paleoenvironmental studies that have taken place in and around this area. Uh, and these, these have documented a number of episodes of environmental change. Um, so we see this in areas such as forest composition, uh, the major cultivars that people were um, um, producing, uh, the intensity of soil erosion, and also the extent of anthropogenic um, fire. So if we take a historical ecology approach, we, get, we should consider that not only climate change, but also pre-Hispanic inhabitants themselves may be, uh, may be responsible for some of these impacts. So at this point, I want to turn to my own research in Chachapoyas uh, and begin to explore the question of what these landscapes did mean for local inhabitants. So if we set aside topographical preconceptions, what do we actually see in terms of how people did structure space and social practice? And if we set aside ecological preconceptions, what do we see in terms of the landscape's ability to sustain large and concentrated populations? Okay, so. In this area, uh, we see um, more or less the extent of what has traditionally been understood as Chachapoyas, so delimited by this yellow line. Um, um, so right in the middle here, we see the Atuan Valley, where my research has been concentrated. Uh, I want to take a moment to uh, kind of give some context here. Um, I will be speaking tonight for the Atuan Valley in particular. Um, but uh, I don't mean for this uh, research to be, or for the presentation to be understood as speaking for all of Chachapoyas. So the area that we traditionally understand as Chachapoyas uh, is a vast area. Um, so if we kind of look at the limits of the, more or less what we understand as the Inca province, uh, this contains about 30,000 square kilometers. This really is a huge area. Um, so this spans a considerable amount of environmental diversity um, but contemporary scholars are also beginning to recognize the great social and political diversity that characterizes this area as well. Um, so for a long time, research focused on the Utkubamba heartland, so following the, the Utkubamba River that runs north-south through this area. Um, but in the recent decades, we're beginning to see a lot of research uh, taking place outside this area. So based on this work, we're starting to see a number of different cultural patterns that suggest that there's a good deal of cultural, potentially ethnic, and probably political diversity too. Um, and we've had some inkling of this for quite some time um, from the ethno-historic record, so we know of a number of groups of different names, such as the Chilchos and the Chiaos. Um, but archaeological evidence at this point is starting to uh, basically confirm what we had suspected for a while. Um, so along with uh, a number of other scholars, uh, I think um, a lot of contemporary researchers are starting to question the utility of the term Chachapoyas altogether, uh, at least prior to the Inca period. <laughs> so I'll just take a, a moment to uh, point out that we have an upcoming volume um, with Foreign Church and myself on precisely this question. So we'll look for that coming out soon. Okay, so now that I've um, pointed out that we have this great diversity, um, I actually do work in this kind of heartland region. Um, so the Atuan Valley is actually among the better known areas of Chachapoyas. This is primarily due to the um, significant influence of Inga Shellerup's work here in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so a number of you may be familiar with her really um, very robust volume. Her work focused in particular on the 
anchor provincial capital of Cochabamba. You see here some of the um, Cusco-style Cusco masonry. Um, but even despite the, the depth of her work here, uh, it really only scratched the surface of local history. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, focus primarily on the Inca period, but on the other hand, this is just such an incredibly rich area, there remains a lot to be studied. So in light of this, my own work here uh, since 2010 has focused on elucidating basic aspects of social and spatial organization at the site cluster of Tambio. Um, and this would be really one of the major concentrations of archaeological remains in the Atuan Valley. Um, so I want to start by just providing uh, an overview of some of the major cultural and environmental features um, of Tambio, uh, which I argue even just um, describing these can give us quite a bit of an insight into uh, human um, landscape relations. So Tambio consists of a cluster of residential sites, mortuary sites, and agricultural infrastructure that's located at the confluence of the Tambio and the Atuan rivers. So most of these sites uh, are located at an altitude of between 3,300 and 3,500 meters above sea level. Uh, so again, I would emphasize that this is actually a fairly uh, high altitude area. So the Tambio landscape is uh, rugged. Uh, it consists of uh, a number of steep landforms uh, that are broken apart by deep canyons of about half a kilometer. So presently, it includes areas of high altitude grassland, so the, the local term here would be halka, um, also spans of montane forests, you get a sense of these here. Um, but also, uh, people have access to Quechua, Quechua areas of lower altitudes within about half a day walk, uh, half a day's walk or so from here. So it's actually um, a good example of kind of a, uh, a landscape naturally suited to um, vertical archipelago kinds of pursuits. Um, and uh, earlier today, um, Warren um, discussed at some length uh, Stephen Thrush's work in the uh, Uchukmarka area. Uh, this is only located about 30 kilometers south of here, um, so definitely um, a similar landscape. So over the course of our survey in this area, we've documented 12 residential sites, uh, which all directly overlook the confluence of the Atuan and the Tambio rivers. So there's a good deal of variation in the size of these areas. Um, a lot of my work um, concentrates on uh, the significance of this. So the sites range in size from less than half a hectare to over seven hectares. And without exception, they're all located on mountain peaks or on ridges. So traveling between these sites uh, can take, you know, depending on the sites that you're, you're moving between, uh, it can take several hours uh, or half a day. So it's difficult terrain to cross, but as far as the crow flies, they're actually spaced very close to each other. So people potentially uh, could have communicated between many of them, um, say via smoke signals uh, or even whistling. Um, and people nowadays, as they move through the landscape, uh, do tend to whistle long distance sometimes. So the question of why people chose to settle these relatively inaccessible mountain peaks has provoked considerable discussion in Chachapoyas. Uh, as in many other parts of the LIP highlands. So in a lot of areas, uh, such as the western Titicaca Basin, uh, this pattern seems very likely to be motivated by defense. Uh, and we clearly see this in a number of features. Um, so things like uh, concentric perimeter walls, uh, parapets, sashes of uh, sling stones uh, or other weapons, uh, etc. But in Chachapoyas, defensive concerns are not reflected in built environments built environments by and large. So perimeter walls have only been documented at a tiny minority of sites. Uh, none of the sites that directly overlook the confluence of these two rivers here uh, have not, um, I'm sorry, so we have not identified perimeter walls uh, at any of the sites that directly overlook this area. And in this context, I think it's important that we consider other factors in explaining settlement patterns. So in this case, I would argue that it seems more likely to have responded to the unique attributes of this local landscape. Um, so for one thing, by placing villages uh, on mountain peaks, people would have avoided uh, the deep shadows that characterize many of these canyon areas. So they would have maximized uh, daylight uh, for both their villages uh, and for their fields. So I think this image over here pretty well conveys that kind of um, sense as you reach late afternoon. 
Um, people also would have enhanced visibility and communication. So once you get down in the canyons, it's difficult to see um, between areas. And also landslides are a common concern in this area, um, especially during the rainy season. So by placing your village up above the landslide, this would have been, um, uh, would have had a functional use. Uh, but beyond this, the distribution of other kinds of ritual and economic infrastructure <coughs> speaks to an intimate familiarity with the affordances of the local landscape. So for example, Tambia has a considerable number of mortuary sites, which seem to indicate a kind of conceptual affinity with natural rock. Um, and in this case, um, this largely tends to be limestone. So the most impressive of these sites uh, are two <coughs> really extensive necropoli. That's uh, the site of La Pitaka and Diablo Lassi. So these are located several hundred meters above the ground surface uh, in a, a cliff face. Uh, they both consist, or, sorry, La Pitaka consists of several hundred um, burial structures, um, so masonry chulpas, uh, also natural caves in which people were placed, um, and many of these are associated with red ochre um, petroglyphs too. So Lakitaka actually uh, represents the single largest um, cliff tomb necropolis in Chachapoyas, even though it has been um, very heavily, almost entirely looted. Uh, so recently, Marla Toyn uh, has worked at Lakitaka uh, and acquired a number of dates. We have some sense of when this was used. Uh, her earliest dates are around 1000 CE, and they span up to the Inca and possibly even the colonial period. Outside of these two sites, however, the majority of tombs actually consist um, of more formal kinds of structures, um, you know, kind of natural settings. Um, so they largely make up corporate burials uh, that are placed under um, the many rock outcrops that occur naturally, naturally throughout this landscape. Um, some of them also take the form of, kind of um, masonry structures sealing off natural caves, uh, and also some of them form uh, freestanding uh, masonry chulpas. Some of these are probably less known um, outside of Chachapoyas. Beyond Tambio, uh, we see other kinds of expressions of this relationship between living rock and spaces of the dead. Um, so one of the interesting uh, practices that we see in Chachapoyas are uh, burials, um, often groups of burials uh, in natural cave systems. Um, so this practice has pretty much, it's been very little uh, published, um, but it's pretty common and, and, and definitely an interesting area for future research. So in addition to mortuary spaces, really impressive swaths of the Tambia landscape were also refashioned into agricultural terraces. Uh, most of the land surface in this area is made up of slopes that are at least 30 degrees, if not more. Uh, so terraces enabled residents to take advantage of terrain that would otherwise have been economically unproductive. Uh, so recently, using drone photography and pedestrian survey, we have identified over 580 hectares uh, of relict bench terraces. Uh, and we've also documented a further 340 hectares of broad field terraces. Um, many of these continue in uh, use by current, um, current farmers, um, but we can presume that many of them are probably uh, pre-Columbian in origin. We have yet to identify any canals uh, associated with these systems, uh, which is not necessarily surprising given the heavy rainfall in this area for much of the year. And in fact, one of the major functions in terracing of this landscape, something that we are um, currently evaluating in our research, uh, is whether they serve primarily to facilitate drainage, uh, so trying to prevent the problem of excess water buildup. Um, so currently we're looking at this um, by building uh, DEMs of the landscape using our um, drone imagery um, and using ArcGIS um, hydrology tools to look at this. Uh, and one of the most distinctive forms of local agricultural infrastructure is the terrace sinkhole. Um, so this is very roughly analogous in form to the Inca site of Morai in the Cusco area. Um, these were formed uh, naturally uh, through the collapse of sinkholes and the karstic landscape, uh, which were then modified uh, artificially. So Inga Schiller at first published some of these, and she uh, postulated that they probably served for drainage, um, but this has not actually been evaluated yet, so we're going to be looking at this in upcoming field seasons. Now, 
Modeling the articulation of all of these features is going to require a far better understanding of chronology than we presently have. Um, so this is a point where I want to point out that a lot of these interpretations are necessarily provisional. Um, this is a very complex area, both in terms of the total number of sites and also the diverse kinds um, of mortuary, agricultural, habitational sites we see going on here. And these difficulties are further compounded by a number of different factors. Um, so it's virtually impossible to use pedestrian survey to establish chronological data in this area. Um, for one thing, when we uh, get into actual sites, uh, habitational sites, uh, the density of uh, vegetation makes ground, uh, ground survey virtually impossible. Um, so that's an issue to start with. Uh, and second, uh, above and beyond that, we still don't have uh, fine-grained ceramic chronologies for this data uh, that would make that possible even if we could see the ground surface. Um, so as a result of that, uh, our chron chronological insights rely at this point primarily on radiocarbon dates. Uh, so uh, Marlon Latoyne's work at La Quetaca produced a set of four dates um, at this point. Uh, and we also have a set of 18 dates from the habitational site in Monte Guido where I did my dissertation work. So, what we can tell at this point is that some, probably a limited population was already present here as early as 200 BCE. Um, so we have uh, a few dates, uh, these are from limited context, so we don't have a great understanding of what was going on here. Um, the first signs of um, the kinds of um, cultural practices that we would traditionally associate with Chachapoyas culture uh, appear around slightly before 1000 CE. Uh, particular stone architecture. Um, but it's really around, only around 1200 to 1250 that we see evidence uh, of a very large population um, that was spread out um, through an extensive uh, area. Um, so people were present here for several hundred years, uh, and then uh, the Inca conquest seems to have taken place around 1450 to 1470. Um, so at a number of different sites, we have found uh, artifacts and uh, architecture um, that are stylistically Inca. And again, this is a preliminary conclusion, but there seems to be some evidence for the reorganization of, popu of the population uh, under Inca control. Um, so initially at Monte Guido, uh, we found signs of abandonment at this point. So we actually find very few Inca artifacts at Monte Guido. Um, so it seems like the population may have been moved out. Um, but our recent work at the site of Kuchikonga suggests that this site may have actually been built uh, at a later date and only briefly occupied. So it seems like some, some sites may have been depopulated while others were settled at this time. Uh, so the, the Inca were present in this area uh, for a while, and then we've also found uh, some evidence of colonial occupations. Um, so recently we found Nueva Cadiz glass beads and Latachino glass, um, so dating from the first half of the 16th century. Um, so what we can say overall is we have a very lengthy history uh, of occupation in this area, um, but a lot remains to be understood. So from this initial overview, several conclusions become clear. Uh, and the, first, uh, the first point would be that substantial populations were present in this area for quite a while, uh, including well before the traditional 1000 CE date that we uh, generally associate with the coalescence of so-called Chachapoy culture. The second major takeaway point would be that the local environment clearly did not pose an insurmountable obstacle to the people who lived here. To the contrary, all evidence suggests that it was recognized as a materially and conceptually rich resource. And in fact, Tambio's scale and the monumentality of its built environments initially invite a categorization of this area as home to some kind of complex society <coughs> during the late pre-Inca period, even despite the lack of evidence for state-level formal organization. So at this point, uh, I want to bring in some of our more specific archaeological, um, or architectural mapping and excavation data from the past um, seven years. Uh, and consider uh, what exactly uh, was the nature of complexity at Tambio. Um, so if this wasn't a state society, um, then what was it? Probably the most definitive characteristic of the site complex is the manner in which its fragmented topography mediated the use of space. 
Although the population size and the density of the settlement cluster would easily qualify as urban, uh, at least by the standards of the pre-Columbian Andes, uh, pre archaic Tumbia was definitely non-urban in its organization, um, at least if we understand traditional models of urbanism. <laughs> So for one thing, rather than clustering in a single extensive area, the population was divided into discrete communities that were physically separated by these deep canyons, uh, which would probably have set limits on the ease and the frequency of interaction. So presumably this would have encouraged the formation of distinct community identities uh, among these separate villages who regularly interacted uh, among themselves on a more regular basis. But at the same time, some kind of intercommunity relations must have been in place in order to govern the use of common landscape resources. Um, so things like the rivers, um, forests, mortuary cliffs, uh, and not to mention the construction and the maintenance of agricultural terraces. Now one of our original research questions was whether Tumbio did in fact represent an integrated settlement system rather than just a series of discrete, uh, largely autonomous smaller villages. So do we actually see this as one thing, uh, or as a series of separate, smaller communities? Now in the area of economic integration, we really don't know yet. So this will be uh, one of the big questions to be addressed. But our studies of architecture and the built environment do suggest that these villages formed a single socially integrated system. And this is best seen through the lens of domestic architecture. In particular, um, I would suggest that we can see how domestic architecture reflects status. And in this regard, we're fortunate to have a truly exceptional level of preservation at many of these sites. This results from the combination of the remote location, so there's very few populations out in this, this area at the present time, um, but also the, the presence of dense forests, which make our lives complicated um, as we do research, uh, but which also uh, create an extraordinary level of um, so these buildings that you see here are very large, but they're not at all exceptional uh, in their level of conservation. Um, we have hundreds of sites, um, hundreds of buildings with this kind of um, uh, level of um, conservation here. So, uh, in a number of uh, places elsewhere, uh, I've argued that we can interpret masonry differences as a basic proxy of social status. The basic idea here is that in order to create finer masonry, this requires a greater input of labor, um, so we can read this as kind of social capital, uh, where households uh, who, had, uh, who could count on the support of more extensive kin networks or ritual relationships uh, or just the participation of greater amounts of neighbors would be able to build uh, bigger and finer houses uh, with more high quality masonry. So very roughly, uh, we can sort out four kinds of categories of masonry at all these sites, uh, ranging from almost brick-like coarse masonry uh, all the way down to more irregular, basically unworked masonry. So there's kind of two points here in understanding social integration. Um, so the first is that at all of the discrete uh, villages of Tambio, uh, we see the whole gamut, so all these different kinds so I would argue that there are significant differences in uh, social status within each individual community. But at the same time, when we look across communities, there's considerable variation in the proportions of masonry at each site. Uh, so on the one hand, at a site like Kuchikonga, the one that was probably built later on, uh, only about 18% of preserved buildings uh, have this kind of fine brick-like masonry. Where a site like La Jolla, 94% of buildings have this kind of masonry. Um, so I would suggest uh, that we can see this as evidence of the differences in status not only characterized each village internally, uh, but also characterized relationships between uh, sites as well. And beyond this, a number of attributes of the built environment also suggest some degree of centralization, uh, or to be a little bit more precise, uh, I would say that they might suggest um, some degree of differences in the concentration of power across communities. This is especially evident at the site of La Jolla, uh, which I would argue probably exercised a dominant role in power relations at Tambia. Um, 
So uh, I just mentioned the very high proportion of um, high status masonry here. Um, beyond this, La Jolla is the only site associated with architecture that is monumental in scale relative to houses. Um, so I say relative to houses is an important qualifier. I'll come back to this in just a moment. Um, but unequivocally, we have quite monumental architecture here. Uh, in addition to these factors, La Jolla is also centrally located. Uh, it overlooks the confluence of the Ohio and Tumbia rivers. Uh, and beyond this, it's the largest site. Um, so it, um, we've recorded over 400 circular structures at this site, so presumably houses. It also spans about seven hectares. Uh, so in terms of both um, number of structures and area, uh, it is roughly comparable to the better known site in Quayla. But despite the evidence for urban-like differences in terms of the concentration of power across settlements, Tamiyo definitely does not adhere to traditional expectations of urban spatial organization. So for one thing, settlement layouts are not characterized uh, by significant architectural diversity, which we would expect of urban configuration. Um, and in this, we could also say, we do see this in other kinds of cities in the Andes, but we don't see this here. So instead, the built environments of sites are actually quite similar. Uh, we, might all, we might almost say repetitive. Um, so they consist in their majority of uh, circular, presumably residential structures. And we only see a handful of special purpose, probably ceremonial structures, that, that were in most cases similar in scale to houses. Uh, beyond this, we have not identified any of the kind of buildings that we might expect uh, to be associated with the centralized administrative apparatus. Um, so for example, we have not identified any kind of non-domestic storage structures. Uh, we also have not identified any kind of um, formalized house movement through the site, um, such as roads. And really, in fact, perhaps the most striking uh, aspect of these built environments uh, is the absence of any kind of central public spaces. Um, so, this would traditionally be a feature that archaeologists would see as completely necessary for populations of this scale. Uh, so none of the sites is organized around any kind of central core of civic or ceremonial buildings. Um, and we only see two sites that have any kind of walled plaza-like spaces. Um, but both of these are fairly small in area uh, and might really be understood better as a large patio or uh, kind of a plazuela type building. Structure. Um, these are actually both associated with high status neighborhoods. Um, so they really don't seem to be public uh, in the sense we ordinarily think of. And here's where I get to the domestic monumentality part. Um, at the same time, the built environments are actually characterized by a very strong emphasis on domestic architecture. Um, so I can go on uh, quite a bit of, of greater length uh, elaborating on this, um, but to keep it short, Houses were very complex, uh, both technically, uh, in terms of their construction and difficult terrains. Uh, also aesthetically, they are incredibly rich uh, in a number of decorative features. And they're also very large structures. Um, so at Tambio, the average house size is about five meters in diameter. Um, so if we uh, calculate those based on the specific gravity of limestone, uh, we can assume that the average size house uh, required about 30 tons of limestone uh, just for the upper portion, so not even including the base. Uh, and if we use the kind of traditional uh, roof model that a number of people, um, or the, the most scholars today, adhere to, uh, this comes to a total uh, of over seven meters in height. Um, so really, by most definitions, the term houses would qualify as monumental architecture. Uh, but an especially interesting twist on this, we see this not only in high-status houses, um, but also in houses with features that, uh, by other kinds of attributes, would qualify as lower status. Um, so for example here, this would be more, uh, a house associated with higher status masonry, um, so both from Montevideo. Um, this one has one of the lower ranked grades of masonry, but it's actually uh, similar in, in height. Um, so to give you an idea of dimensions, the base on this one is about four meters high. So in effect, I would say that houses in general really seem to have been the main architectural site uh, in which the power relations of display and labor are concentrated. Um, where we don't see this is in the kinds of structures we would traditionally understand as public architecture. 
So overall, it's pretty clear that the differences um, in status and power were significant at Tumbio's communities as these were expressed through the built environment. But political practice does not appear to have included many of the forms with which archaeologists are most familiar. Um, so we don't see a lot of evidence for large gatherings in dedicated central spaces, uh, and we don't see the co-option of monumentality by a restricted segment of the population. So to come back to the question of landscape, um, to what extent was this distinctive kind of organization uh, directly attributable to the steep and broken landscape of Tokyo? So I think it would be foolhardy to say that this didn't play some kind of role. Um, so many of the sites, uh, or virtually all of the sites here, are located on areas that are um, very uh, steep with limited open and flat space. Um, so undoubtedly this encouraged some kind of uh, innovation uh, or experimentation with um, how to express social relations through the built environment. Um, but on the other hand, I would not suggest that the landscape was an absolute determinant here. Um, so a good counterexample in this regard uh, is the mesa top of Tahoe Pampa, which is located uh, at the um, right in the center of the Tambio area. Um, so this is where we see the eponymous um, Tombo of Tambio. Uh, so this area was quite central, um, and uh, it really consists of the only flat space extensive flat space uh, in this area. Um, but the only archaeological remains here are those of the Tombo. So I think, I think, of course, it would probably be difficult to imagine that people never gathered here uh, in large groups. Um, but what I would see as more significant is that the, these kinds of events were never formalized uh, through the creation of dedicated architecture and that specifically public gatherings. Okay, so up to this point, I've covered a lot of um, the architectural data that um, reflects my dissertation research, as well as some of my ongoing research. Uh, but I think it's important to look beyond the bounds of the built environment uh, and look at broader, um, broader kinds of built structures uh, and broader kinds of landscape relationships outside villages, per se. Uh, so this is more the direction of where I'm going uh, at the present. Um, so I want to take a little time to think about some of the implications of these kinds of political organization. Uh, so as we build a more detailed picture of what complexity meant at Tembio, it'll be important to also consider how power relations ordered the use of the broader landscape. So I'm going to come back to the question of terraces. Um, so really the scale of terrace construction at Tembio is staggering. So 15% of the land surface in this greater area is covered by terraces. They're not only uh, numerous in total extent, but also in terms of the proportion of the landscape. Now, undoubtedly, some of these were either built uh, or expanded under uh, Inca control. Uh, but even in spite of that, I think it's pretty safe to assume that a significant amount of infrastructure was in place uh, during the late intermediate period. Um, so this is indicated on the one hand by the overall scale of settlement in this area. Um, but we also see this confirmed in uh, the dietary data from our domestic assemblages at Monte Vudo. Uh, so during this work, uh, we confirmed that diets uh, from the LIP uh, consist primarily of high altitude products, um, so items that were probably produced in this local area rather than being brought in from abroad. Um, this included cultivars such as potatoes and kiwicha. Uh, we also found a number of uh, examples of juveniles in our faunal assemblage, so this seems to suggest that uh, herds were being raised locally as well, uh, potentially in the higher altitude hulk areas. So in the context of Tempio's heavily fragmented landscape, um, it's going to be important in the future to determine uh, questions such as uh, whether terrace fields and the products of local agriculture were equally or unequally distributed among communities. In addition, uh, we'll want to look at how the absence of irrigation systems impacted the creation and the use of terrace fields. So obviously, questions of labor organization and large-scale uh, agrohydraulic infrastructure have been uh, a subject of great debate in the Andes, um, so I think this will contribute in a substantive way to this debate as we look further at this area. A second 
second factor cons to consider uh, in looking at human landscape relations here is demography and the issue of the long-term, uh, or we might say sustainable use uh, of shared resources. So at the present, Tambillo is home to a maximum, maximum of perhaps 300 people. Um, most of them lived permanently in the nearby town of Lene Bamba uh, and come up here on occasion to uh, maintain their herds and their fields. During our survey, though, we counted a total of 1,400 circular structures uh, in the archaeological sites of the immediate Tambio area. So if we kind of uh, assume a rough estimate of five to seven people per building, this uh, generates a maximum pre-Hispanic population estimate of somewhere on the order of seven to 10,000. Um, so even if we, uh, if we assume a very conservative, conservative estimate of around 6,000 people, uh, we still uh, end up with a population that was somewhere on the order of 20 times higher than that of the present. So this population was clustered in a landscape uh, that is uh, today perceived uh, as somewhat fragile <coughs> or marginal, depending on um, uh, uh, depending on whose opinion this goes with. Um, so this would seem to apply that either pre-Hispanic land use of this magnitude con contributed severely to environmental degradation, uh, or that mechanisms were in place to promote sustainable practices uh, for this number of people. This question is particularly germane to the issue of deforestation. Um, so generally this is perceived as a modern phenomenon that resulted from the incorporation of this area into national and global economies. Uh, today the landscape is largely deforested, but looking at these kinds of population estimates, we might assume that already in the pre-Hispanic pre period, uh, the local population was placing considerable demands on forest health. So for example, to come back to this model uh, of the typical kind of Chachapoyo uh, house and Chachapoyo roof, um, this model posits that uh, the roof would have required 25 beams uh, for its construction. So if we multiply this times 1,400 buildings, this comes to a total of 35,000 trees that had to be felled to roof the entire settlement cluster just one time over. Uh, and obviously roofs uh, made of thatch are perishable, so we can assume that that's kind of a lowball estimate. So we're talking a very large number of trees here. So how the population ensured the long-term availability of forest resources and how they balance this with the land use requirements of agriculture and pasture remain open questions to be considered. So one possibility here is the communities practice some kind of forest management, um, which um, Alex Chepstow Lusty uh, and his colleagues have argued in the case of the Inca. Um, certainly forest management is something that we see kind of widely throughout the Amazon as well. But at a broader level, I think it's important that we also emphasize that local, uh, the local ecosystems wouldn't have remained stable over time. So I think this should underlie uh, many of our interpretations or the way we frame questions as we go forward. The contemporary landscapes that we take as an interpretive baseline are very different from those that people experienced or, or created uh, in the past. Uh, this is certainly not just due to changes in landscape during the modern period or even the colonial era. Uh, Pre-Columbian populations, too, would have dramatically reshaped the landscape, um, certainly to the same extent, uh, if not even more so. And I would also say that it's important to recognize that these changes were not just a matter of adaptation to the cloud forest environment. Um, so instead, they were the product of specific cultural uh, practices, in particular socio-political orders. Uh, so in this talk, I focus mainly on the late intermediate period, um, but as our research moves forward and we gain a better sense of chronology, it'll be important to understand how successive groups from the LIP to the Inca uh, to the Spanish reorder this landscape to suit their own needs and their own agendas. So to sum up, what might we take away from this discussion of the specific context of Tobio, uh, and how, we, how might we use this to start thinking about broader histories of people and landscape in the Eastern Andes? So I would argue that above all, uh, future research needs to immediately discard the idea that these landscapes, uh, and especially montane forests, were somehow inherently more limiting than other Andean landscapes. Um, so we all work in areas with their own challenges. Um, there's nothing that specifically sets the Eastern Andes apart as inherently more difficult. For 
its pre-Hispanic inhabitants, Tambia was neither an impenetrable jungle uh, nor a precarious Eden in danger of destruction at the hands of development. Um, instead, it was a deeply evocative and a physically rich landscape uh, that both allowed and necessitated the development of unique forms of social practice. And so I'd say there's a couple of correlates here that I might take away. Um, the first thing here would be that focusing on the limitations of Eastern Andean landscapes has historically discouraged the study of this region and deprived Andean archaeology more broadly of the insights that this region has to offer. In addition to this, it inaccurately represents the Eastern Andes as a kind of timeless wilderness uh, outside the scope of anthropogenic changes. Not only is this inaccurate, um, but it also denies agency to the populations who did inhabit this area. But most importantly, a focus on the limitations of these environments closes off the possibility of discerning otherness uh, and of actually being surprised by contacts that can push our world building efforts forward. So in conclusion, Chachacoyas has certainly had more than its share of spectacular archaeological discoveries in recent decades. Definitely uh, a few here in my list. Um, but what I, what I would say is most impressive are the unexpected <laughs> ways that people crafted their worlds in places that were long assumed to lie at the limits of human habitability. Um, and I want to wrap up by thanking the institutions and the many individuals and groups uh, who have made this work possible uh, over the years. Um, and I'll be here with yet another beautiful uh, image in this area. So thank you very much. generally, obviously, but specifically to the height of buildings. Um, so the best preserved houses, the kind of upper structure walls, are around two meters or so. Um, and again, I would stress that this is for this local area, so other areas of Chachin Place have different kinds of house floors. So upper walls tend to be around two meters. Uh, the roof proportion, so this is large, this reconstruction is largely based on an experimental model by Morgan Davis, which is based on the, uh, 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 the last documented extant house in the 19, late 19th century, I believe, um, that had a similar sort of <coughs> um, So that's where the, the specifically the very uh, sharply angled roof model came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that adds to several more meters, just in the roof. Um, but then the base is an interesting question. So not all of the houses have these, um, what I would call platform bases. Uh, some of them seem to be uh, adaptational or have had a functional aspect in allowing people to build on really steep slopes. Um, so for instance, the, the building that I showed with the four meter high base, that's an extremely steep slope uh, that's even difficult to walk on. So in other areas, that kind of uh, function would have been fulfilled by larger platforms and a number of buildings could be placed on. Um, so in some cases, those do seem uh, to respond to an architectural necessity, um, but in other cases, they seem to be a reflection of status. So I'd say it's a very case-specific kind of example. You might take that as illustrative of the fact that uh, domestic architecture is quite variable uh, and shaped by a number of factors. Also, kind of responding more specifically to your question, too. Uh, in this area, buildings almost always face outward, um, so out to the landscape and down slope. So, I think there could be a lot of explanation for that. Were there tombs beneath the house floors of these sites, and was that part of the base construction? Yeah, that's a great question. So, in most areas of Chachapoyas that have been studied so far, that's the case. So like, like quite a lot, there are burials found in house floors. 
This is actually not the case in this local uh, twin area, uh, which is surprising and unusual. Um, in this case, I think this might be related to the fact that bedrock occurs very close to the surface, so it would have been very labor-intensive to, to bury people in the floors. Um, thanks, Anna. That was fun. Um, I, uh, I'm really glad you brought up the, that I hadn't really thought much about um, baby stressing um, the forest uh, in terms of the amount of wood needed for construction of all of these buildings. Um, and one thing that is seen in the paleoecological records uh, that have been um, completed in the high areas are a con almost a conversion at a certain point after say 800 or 900 to all this uh, cult maybe cultivation literally just like uh, Alex Chipstow Lusk he talks about in the Cusco area it may be going on say in the, the, uh, the Laguna uh, Pomacochas in north of just sort of in this northern part of what we call Dutch Point is a big it's a, it's a really great big open expanse around a, a lake, and it seems like it, it went from maize to all this fairly quickly, and then it was all all this, all the time, and um, to the point where it, 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 it just seemed like it was, uh, it was a very intentional thing they were doing, and I think that still, they, they love all this up there. It, it grows quickly, it's straight. It's, it's the eucalyptus, it's the pre-Columbian eucalyptus. So um, it makes a whole lot of sense if you have this high demand um, to actually be you know, promoting the cultivation of all of this in, in these places and a good explanation for why it's showing up um, in these places where paleoecologists have been working. And I don't think they've even really thought in, uh, in terms of what you've just been saying in statistics the amount of wood needed. So uh, anyway, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I would confirm that. And I, it will be really interesting as research moves forward in the paleo environmental front and um, archaeological front too to see how that unfolds. Yeah, and also in different areas too. Great talk. Really great. I have a couple questions for you. And they're busy beyond you're beyond the scope of this particular talk, but what is what is long distance exchange look like during the LIP? Maybe from the West. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking to what is what does long distance exchange look like in these communities? Uh, so speaking to our excavation results from this particular area, uh, we have we found a couple shards uh, from uh, from those early contexts around 200 BC, to the best of our knowledge, that are uh, very small, uh, potentially Cajamarca alike, but really it's a bit difficult to tell. Uh, we definitely, in the earlier contexts, we find uh, clays that have a high quantity of kaolin, uh, so that seems to be indicating different kinds of of interaction. Um, I can't speak a whole lot uh, from this particular context uh, to the ceramic uh, indices of long distance exchange. Uh, in terms of botanicals, we see uh, different elements from different distances, but very small proportions overall. Um, so we have things like beans and maize uh, and quinoa that would have been more from these <laughs> zones nearby. Uh, we have a, a couple really just, I think, two elements that probably came from real lowland areas to the east, um, so gourd fragments. So there is small evidence for the fact that there was this very far distance exchange, but as to who was doing it, what portion of the population was doing it, um, I, think, I think we'll be able to say more as future research goes on.
the first question was on centralized planning. Um, no, there's no real evidence for centralized planning. Uh, I'd, I'd be quick to add, though, that that doesn't mean no planning. So I would say that planning is probably better localized between neighbors. You know, obviously, to build a house of this size, you couldn't just kind of build this and then find out after the fact that that was an issue. So there's probably um, formalized and ad hoc kinds of negotiations that went on for that. Uh, and inter really interesting aspects of, of this, these built environments uh, is the lack of developed outdoor space. Um, so houses are very close set for the most part, um, but also even within sites, these are really steep, um, this really steep terrain. Um, so there are really not a lot of patios to speak to speak of. So I think probably there were not a lot of activities going on out in outdoor areas. This would obviously have implications for kinds of uh, informal domestic uh, practices. Um, so I would suspect that these more often took place indoors in this context than in other areas um, of the LIP Highlands with similar kinds of topographical organization. organization. Um, I think you asked about movement too. So there, there are not there are not formal or stone paths to the sites. So like an, an analogy that people bring up often are Tyrona sites. Um, there's nothing like that. So again, it seems to be that um, movement was ad hoc, that there were probably variable kinds of move, routes of movement that people took to the site at different times. Um, so in general, buildings are very close set. So there's more of an emphasis on interior space than on exterior. Before, but um, the, the status uh, issue with the masonry, um, is, there, is there anything else that, that correlates with that? Because I mean, um, just looking at, you know, thinking about the practices involved with, with that masonry, uh, do you have a sense of how, how different that would be in terms of sort of time investment? And then I guess the corollary would be, with, you know, are there other things we're seeing internally in the spaces in terms of uh, alignments, in terms of yeah, yeah labor employee. Um, is there anything else going on there? Yeah, so I I would be hesitant to just um, make a direct equation between masonry, labor input and masonry um, status in a very human directional way. Um, statistically, there's a number of other factors going on here. So <laughs> higher quality masonry correlates with um, larger interior areas, uh, also with presence of special purpose features like um, friezes in particular. Um, also, buildings with uh, finer masonry tend to occur closer to site center, to like, well, at least in Monte Duna, um, they're clustered around the site center, so they're located to um, areas with other kinds of special purpose features. Um, so, altogether, these lines of evidence, I would suggest, you know, speak to greater social capital symbolic capital of um, the people who are living with living in these houses, or at least who are building these houses, I would say. Is, is it possible to think about that in terms of sort of expertise in craft production? At, you know, masonry at craft production, and this being kind of a, a demonstration of that skill in production? Yeah, well I guess that would, that would hinge on the question of whether the house residents were the artisans too. Um, I, I don't like, I've, I've speculated on this. I don't have a lot of strong answers. Um, I would think it would be quite like, you know, like, given the technical specialization of things like these roofs. Um, so another point would be that these are not, we have never found evidence of a center post to support the roofs um, in the pre anca period. Um, so since we, we're not really sure how they build these roofs, uh, even at this point, they probably have fairly complex engineering. Uh, and looking at it now to say, vernacular architecture in West Africa and some of the construction techniques, I think it would be uh, very possible that there were uh, art, um, like master architects or craft persons who either possess these kinds of technical construction skills uh, or also you know, could create some of these more uh, specialized features like freezes. Uh, so yeah, that would be a, a complex answer as to whether um, 
those were the actual builders of the houses, or perhaps whether builders had special access to these uh, specialized artisans too, but you can see that as a kind of measure of status. Question that um, I think people thought more about in the past, and just has it has not been resolved. Though I would say there's been less attention paid to it. Um, I can't. I'm not aware of any features within um, villages themselves that um, are infrastructural features designed to address water supplies. Um, one thing in that uh, in that area would be that some scholars have uh, postulated that roof construction was designed to, um, to to shed water and keep it away from the base from the foundations of buildings. So uh, within you know, preservation of the house itself, um, it was designed for that. Um, and as to moving water throughout the site in a bigger scale, um, I, I don't. I would say we don't see any evidence for that at this point. I want to thank Anna for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking talk. I feel like I know a corner of Chachapoy is much better at this point. Um, that last major event for this meeting will be the president's reception in the archaeological research facility just a few steps away.